An unknown author once said of losing one's mother, You can shed tears that she is gone, or you can smile because she has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that she'll come back, or you can open your eyes and see all she's left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see her, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember her and only that she's gone, or you can cherish her memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you can do what she'd want. Smile, open your eyes, love, and go on. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Coffee, Tea, and Crime. This is Dana, and in today's episode, JR and I will be traveling across two states, Arkansas and Illinois, in order to take a closer look at the brutal slayings of four young women who all died at the hands of a serial killer between 1969 and 1970. This is the story of the 27 killer, the murders of Obi Ash, Jean Bianchi, Janice Bolliard, and Jean Lingenfelter. Our story opens with Obi Faye Ash, a petite married mother of three living in the small town of Cotter in Baxter County, Arkansas. It's December 3, 1969, and the 32-year-old is heading northeast to do some shopping in the neighboring community of Mountain Home a quick 15-minute jaunt down Highway 412. Her first stop that morning was in the north part of town in the College Shopping Center at the intersection of North College and Highway 62. After hitting a few stores there, she motored back south to the Ozark Shopping Center. From there, she made her final stop a couple of blocks south at the town square where she visited a drugstore and a TV repair shop. And then she just vanished. Her husband, a barber in Cotter, arrived home at around 6.30 that evening and became concerned to find Obi had not come home. He called around to relatives and friends, frantically trying to find out if anyone had seen his wife. He notified police and a search began. A local radio station broadcasted information on Obi and her VW bug. A concerned citizen located the car parked on Main at the intersection of 9th beside the Baxter Furniture Company. He alerted a sheriff's deputy and the pair returned to the car. Obi was found in the back floorboard tied with wire, strangled, and stabbed repeatedly. The autopsy results showed Obi had been beaten, strangled, raped, and sodomized. She had suffered 13 stab wounds to the area of her shoulders and neck. Investigators with the state and local police searched high and low for the killer with no success. Women in Baxter County were fearful of the unknown killer that was evidently stalking about the countryside. They need not have been, for death had left the state and headed northeast. Death had been trained by the military, was married, and had a child, and the state of Illinois would rue the day he came calling to their state. Jean Bianchi was a 27-year-old housewife and mother of two living in the Woodlawn area of McHenry, Illinois, a small town on the outskirts of Chicago. It was round about 9 p.m. on the 27th day of January as Jean headed out to the laundromat in downtown McHenry, just a few minutes away from the house. She hung a right on West Elm and crossed the bridge over the Fox River, and four blocks later, she was pulling to a stop at the Suds and Duds, numbered 3406, and sitting on the north side of West Elm. She was washing the family's clothes and writing a letter to a friend as cars motored by on the main thoroughfare. The driver of one car certainly noticed her sitting in the empty business, and after making the block, He watched Jean for several minutes from the street before walking in. He pulled a knife on Jean and told her if she cooperated and left with him, she would live. Leaving her partially written letter and folded laundry behind, she was led away to her killer's car. He knew the area and almost certainly drove two blocks further west on Elm before heading south on North Greer Street. 
After a few minutes, the roadway's name would change to Barville, and the glow of streetlights would be replaced with inky blackness. He pulled off the road and brutally raped Jean, stabbed her several times, and bludgeoned her until she stopped moving. Continuing south on Barville, he stopped on the Pearson Bridge, pulled Jean's unmoving form from his car, and tossed her over the guardrail into the frozen stream some 15 feet below before driving off southbound. He turned around at West Wright Road, about 800 feet south of the bridge, and headed back north towards McHenry. As he got to the bridge, he saw to his amused horror the form of Jean crawling up the bank of the creek. He stopped and calmly kicked her in the face, sending her tumbling back into the creek. He climbed down and attempted to drown Jean, but she fought back so forcefully that he resorted to stabbing her twice more. He then sexually violated her once more before he climbed up the creek bank and headed home to his own wife and child. Jean had called her husband sometime between 10 and 10.30 p.m. to say she was almost done with the clothes and would be home shortly. It was nearing midnight when Mr. Bianchi called the police to report his wife missing. A McHenry police prowler, and for those uninformed like myself, prowler is police jargon for a patrol car, made the scene at the laundry and quickly discovered the Bianchi family car parked outside the business, her family's laundry and the unfinished letter sitting on a folding table. Within hours, a multi-agency search was underway for Jean, but after three days, the combined forces of the McHenry City Police, the Illinois State Police, the McHenry County Sheriff's Office, and the FBI could not find her. What transpired next would never make it into the media's privy. A nice little old lady who happened to be a member of the Cosmic Circle of Friendship in Chicago told her pastor about visions she was having concerning the disappearance. The pastor, who had married the Bianchis, called the husband, who told the sheriff. To his credit, when the sheriff of McHenry County was told, he invited the lady up to help. A deputy, along with her pastor, rode around at Ms. Beanley's direction while relaying information to other deputies. She talked of a long country road and a bridge that spanned a creek. Jean's body was soon found, but credit for spotting the body was bestowed upon the state police helicopter. Her description of the killer would later prove to be highly accurate. An autopsy revealed that Jean's teeth were knocked out, her face badly distorted from the beating, and she was stabbed 17 times in the neck, back, and chest. Her liver was lacerated, her vagina was traumatically lacerated. Janice Bolliard, a resident of Evanston, was 22 years old and engaged to be married. She worked at Resin Research Laboratory at the DeSoto Chemical Company, 1700 Mount Prospect, in De Plain, Illinois. It was February 27th, exactly a month since the death of Jean Bianchi. Sadly, Janice was working the late evening hours, as was the killer, who seemed to have an astrological hang-up with the number 27, and was working at the same facility that night. The sadistic antagonist of our story followed the victim into the basement area of the laboratory. He cornered Janice and made sexual advances, which she promptly spurned. He beat her senseless before putting her in a chokehold until she had fallen into unconsciousness. He dragged her body into a second room where he violently raped her. When he was done, he used her pantyhose to strangle her to death. Janice's body was found the next day after her fiancé reported her missing and security at the plant performed a search. Her autopsy showed vaginal and rectal trauma. Jean Ann was a 17-year-old senior at McHenry Community High School. It was May 27, 1970. Her graduation was coming soon, and the honor student was excited. She had recently attended her prom along with two other couples. Her date for the prom was young, quiet, handsome, had been a helicopter door gunner in the Vietnam War, and murdered at least three women while stationed in Germany. On the evening of the murder, Jean had walked over to a friend's house to study for final exams. After staying for a couple of hours, she left. 
She was seen getting into a car of a killer, and the pair drove to Lakeland Park. While sitting in his car, Jean was strangled to unconsciousness. Her nose and jaw were broken. Her liver was lacerated. Her vagina was violently torn with the neck of a beer bottle and finally strangled to death with her bra. He drove her nude body to nearby Lake McCullum and dumped her. Some reports say the killer dumped her in the water and one says it was on the little beach on the east side. Her parents became worried when she didn't return home and a search began. Feigning concern for Jean, the killer assisted law enforcement with the search for her. He not unsurprisingly actually found her body, thus making him, in his mind, a hero. The autopsy showed a brain concussion, a broken jaw, nose, and neck, several loose teeth, cuts on the head, neck, and face, two black eyes, internal hemorrhaging, abrasions over much of the body, and a complete vaginal rectal perforation. It was to be the final murder of Mark Allen Smith. Under police questioning, he confessed to Gene's murder. It wasn't long before he was confessing to all the murders. He had worked at the TV repair shop in Mountain Home, just off the town square the day Obie had walked in. His grandmother had owned a resort in that neck of the woods and had moved there after his hitch in the service was over. Sadly, after his confession, several people living in Mountain Home did remember seeing a VW parked at the shop, but didn't make the connection at the time for some reason. With the heat on in Arkansas, he had decided to move his family back home to McHenry. In 1971, he was sentenced to consecutive terms totaling 500 years in prison in Illinois. If he ever gets paroled in Illinois, Arkansas has a few hundred years waiting for him to serve. And if you're thinking the military trained him to be a killer, then you'd be wrong. You see, when he was eight years old, he strangled a female classmate, but fortunately didn't kill her. At the tender age of nine, he stabbed a playmate with a penknife. Smith evidently was truly born a bad, cruel, and sadistic being. One day Smith will die, and that will probably be the only humanly thing he will have done. Well, as J.R. loves to quote from one of his favorite movies, Take This Thing Back to Baltimore. And that'll do it for another episode of Coffee, Tea, and Crime. Let us know what you think about this case in the comments below. And if you have a suggestion for a specific case you'd like us to cover in a future episode, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so, so much for watching. And give us a like if you enjoyed this video by hitting that thumbs up button. And don't be shy either. Go on and hit that subscribe button while you're down there. Stay safe out there. And JR and I will see you on the next case.